No, we'll go ahead and get started. Turn to page number 63. 63. This world is not my home, but I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from a better Lord's door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, I know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? Savior's love 
us that love and it grows that love within us and shows us in fact how to love and that's the uh, the emphasis of what uh, John was saying and again just to uh, reiterate the as John talks about um, loving the Lord and loving one another now I was thinking about something this week and I was thinking about it in this respect you know how many of us have something in our lives that is broken, frail, uh, something that maybe is imperfect, but yet we have a great appreciation, I'll say. Now, it might be some old artifact, it might be some memory, it might be something from our past or maybe even uh, from relatives. And the fact of the matter is is we keep it because it has meaning to us. It, it means something to us because it either by association of someone or something uh, and it has that meaning to us and in fact of the matter is we would probably, Brother George, even use the vernacular of saying I love this because it was mom's or I love this because it belonged to to grandma or I love this because it was given to me by someone very special to me something of that sort now at the same time uh, if we had uh, for instance uh, an, an old car and we might say well I love that old car <laughs> I love that old car you know uh, and and uh, and I know at the same time with that appreciation of, of an old vehicle and everything like that I've never known anybody uh, that would turn away a brand new car just because they loved an old car you know I mean fact of the matter is uh, that new car uh, theoretically brother Glenn theoretically doesn't need the repairs it doesn't need the maintenance, the same level of maintenance. It doesn't need the same, uh, you know, type of care, things of that sort. Uh, you know, I, I realize there could be appreciation for an old fixer-upper house, car, or something like that, and say, oh, I love this place. I, I love it. But at the same time, who of us would not uh, mind living in a brand new house? Who of us would not mind having a place that when we walked in, we knew that when we walked in, uh, 
There would not be late nights having to spend repairing things. There would not be uh, weekends where we were having to go back and, and fix things of that sort. Now, I mean, you know, I realize things happen, but at the same time, uh, you know, we in this world, in, in our world, we have a love or appreciation for things even though they are broken. Do we not? Okay. But yet, could you imagine someone saying, I don't love something that's new? I mean, you know, what child has had toys that when they get a new toy, they, they love that new toy. Why? Because it's new. When you buy, like I said, if you buy a house, you know, it's new. It may, may not be brand new, but it's new to you even. But, you know, the, there's, a, there's something about it. Now, let me just take it a step further. If we have such value, place such value, and we have such love for things that are imperfect, it would be strange to say something that is perfect was loved or appreciated less. Does that, does that make sense? To say because something is perfect or because it is without flaw, I don't care for it as much as I would something that is imperfect or broken or flawed. Well, in essence, that's what John is addressing here when he says, if a man say he loved God, but hate his brother. He's reminding us that the fact is is that, that there should be that love for God and that love for our fellow man, not just one or the other. In fact is, how can a man, as he went on and said, how can a man say he loves God and hate his brother? So in other words, how can someone have that love and that appreciation for that which is perfect when in fact we, uh, we don't even have that value or that appreciation for those for our, our fellow man. And, and so uh, John gives us this and he reminds us in verse 21 and he reminds us very simply, he says, and this commandment have we from him. Now, I think sometimes, you know, we get this idea, well, you know, have you ever heard someone say, well, I know what the Bible says, but... I know what God says, however. Well, you know, if, if we look through the Bible and we study uh, through the Bible and, and the things of what the Lord uh, teaches us, uh, we find that in Matthew 22, verse 37, I just want to hit some of these verses here real quick. Matthew 22 and verse uh, 37, uh, here's what the Bible says teaches or instructs us. Matthew 22, and verse 37, he said, Then Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Now that's, that's an instruction. That's a commandment that God has given to us. Look in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. He says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Again, that's Jesus talking. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. And I realize these are just different uh, writers' perspective of the same thing, but I, I just want to share these with you. And in fact, the Bible says, And he answering said, This uh, this is in fact the Lord. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. All commandments that our Lord is giving concerning us loving Him. Now, John, of course, Jesus talking to Peter, John relates it a little bit different. In John chapter 21, and uh, verse 15, when our Lord was talking to Peter, and he said, So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, 
Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, uh, I, I believe it's safe to say that, that the Bible clearly teaches that we ought to love the Lord and have a love for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 22, Paul writing said, if, a, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anatha maranatha. Now that anatha maranatha, that just simply says that that person is accursed. That's the anatha. Maranatha means when our Lord comes. So in other words, he says if someone says they love the Lord, but they do not in fact love the Lord, then at the return of the Lord they will be accursed. And that's what that anatha maranatha is. Now, the thing is, is that, that uh, you know, John writing and he said if a man say he loved God, now, there's a lot of people that claim it, a lot of people that say it, but yet the fact of the matter is, is the Lord knows our heart. He sees beyond just what we say. And so Paul reminds us that, that, in, that in that day when the Lord returns, just because someone claims it, just because someone says it, but yet they in fact do not love the Lord, he said there will be a curse that will be upon them. Paul writing again in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 24. He says, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Uh, again, uh, I think Paul is reminding us of, of, uh, that it's more than just a claim. It's more than just a, a comment. It's more than just you know, say, saying something along this lines, but it's, it is actually uh, believing it in our heart and carrying it out uh, in our heart as well. Now, also, uh, last of all, in the book of Philemon, and uh, in the book of, of Philemon, and I know it's still in here, and I, it should be right after... Where'd it go? Well, Philemon 1 5 says this Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward the saints. Now, the, the bottom line being is all of these verses teach this idea of loving the Lord. The idea that, that it's not something that is just casual, it's not something that is just taken lightly, but it is in fact something that, that the Bible actually is very serious about. That even the Lord Himself said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, in a couple places with all thy strength. In one place even says, And thy neighbor as thyself. So then with all that commandment, with all that instruction, if someone makes this claim and they say that I love God but I hate my brother <clears throat> then John states very distinctly that he's a liar for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen how can he love God in whom he hath not seen there goes back to the idea how can we say that we love something that is imperfect. And then, and, and then uh, uh, how can we love something that is imperfect and then claim to love something that is perfect but yet we have not even seen yet? That love for, uh, for mankind or to hate that which is imperfect and then not love that and then claim to love that which is perfect. James or John is just giving this stronger argument 
from the authority and the Word of God uh, concerning this love of God because he said the fact of the matter is is these two hinge together. They literally hinge together in the sense that, that if we claim to love one but yet we despise the other, uh, there is something that is wrong because that love that God has for us is a uh, an overcoming love. It's a forgiving love. It's a it's a love uh, without uh, 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 demeaning or demeanor or anything of that sort. It truly is a, a an instruction and a commandment to uh, to love the Lord. And 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 th and he said there in verse twenty one, this is the commandment that we have from Him. Who is Him? He's he's talking about the Lord Himself. So I think sometimes we, you know, we overlook this idea because we think, well, God's perfect. Sure, I can love Him. That's easy. But yet John just reminds us that, that you know, we've not even seen God. We don't even ha have a true knowledge of God in our humanity. But yet we say that we hate someone whom we have seen or someone that we relate with, but yet we claim to love God in whom we haven't seen. And, and so John is just giving us this extra emphasis. And then as he moves into chapter 5, he moves back into chapter 5, and, and just what basically what John is reminding us is that the same Holy Spirit that taught that love that he mentions in prior verses, that taught us that love also taught us obedience. That man cannot truly love the children of God who by habit commit sins or neglect or, or, or neglects known duty and then claim that we do love God. And so he is reminding us it's that same Holy Spirit that taught us that love that actually teaches us that obedience. And what is that obedience? That obedience is to love not only God, but to love our brother as well. And, and so John is literally hinging the two and tying the, the, uh, the two together. And, and, and he continues with this idea or this thought when he says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now, uh, this is not just talking about the only begotten of Jesus Christ. This is talking about those that have been birthed into the family of God. John is reminding us in, in these, these verses here that, that from the standpoint that uh, if we have this trust and this belief and this faith in Christ, but yet we are narrow in our relationship to our fellow man, there is something that is wrong. There, there is something that's out of kilter. Uh, the, uh, uh, the evidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God uh, that truth that is birthed within us, uh, he, he goes back and he has said that several times concerning having that, uh, that belief and knowing and believing that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh in chapter 4 verse 3, that he is the Son of God. Uh, he, uh, he talks about the witness of the Holy Spirit of God in that in chapter 5 and verse 6. He's talking about that record which is born in heaven in chapter 5 and uh, verse 7. Uh, he talks about the credit which is due to the testimony in chapter 5 and verse 8. He goes on and on and in fact even in 11 and 12 the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And so all of these facts, all of these arguments if you please give evidence to the fact that Jesus Christ was born of God through Mary upon this earth. And John wrote, wrote these things to remind us concerning our love for the Lord and our love for Christ that the Messiah, the one, the Lamb of God, the, the one meaning the Christ, that, that here he, he intends and gives this, this reminder to us that we are to love the Lord but yet at the same time, it is believing that Jesus Christ is Christ, is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat him loveth him also that is begotten of him. So John is reminding us that 
there is to be that relationship between not only loving God, but that which is born of God, being those that have believed and trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those that love the Lord, uh, again, how can we say that we love God and hate our brother when in fact that brother is born of God? Now, now this is not just talking about loving mankind. Uh, this is not talking about loving the world. This is, you know, uh, the world says, you know, the thing is, is that you should just love everybody and show that love to everybody. And now, folks, I believe that the Bible teaches that there is a difference in the way that we love the lost and the way that we love our brethren. Mm -hmm. Now, there is some similarities in that. But the fact of the matter is, is that, that, uh, that love for the lost is a love in the sense that we desire them to come to Christ. But yet when a person does come to Christ, it, uh, it changes the relationship because they now become a believer, a, a brother, a sister in Christ. And it changes the idea of that relationship because then at that point, as Christians, we all are of the same Father. We then constitute one family. We all bear the same image and we have the same favor or the resemblance there. We, we've come under the same obligation or our gratitude, if you please, uh, in respect to the Lord. Now, let's, let's face it. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is there's something about family uh, when we have that relationship. Now, I know not all families get along. I know that not all families have that close tie and relationship, but at the same time, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, with those few exceptions, the understanding is, is that when someone's family, uh, it has a different relationship. Now, someone may be like family, and the fact is, is we may bring them into the fold, so to speak, into our, our physical relationship. They may not necessarily be blood, but we treat them as, as if they were. And we bring them into the family. Of course, when we marry, we marry into families. And, uh, and you know, the thing is, is that, that uh, what John is saying is that, that when you come into the family of God, uh, that we, we have that same, uh, that same father, that same family resemblance, the same image, uh, that of Christ, the same obligation, the same fulfillment uh, of all those things, and that in that should be a commonality of love one towards another. Now, this is what, this is what John is reminding us, that there is that commonality and that we are of the Lord in our salvation and so therefore that should uh, if you please take that relationship a notch higher than just the world now I realize that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life but my friend today that love that God has for the world if you please is, is actually even in a different relationship than that love for the redeemed. Now you say, how can you say that? Well, uh, now, I realize that God doesn't love one more than the other, but it's a different love because the fact is is that God loves everyone so much that He died for them. But He doesn't, and that love doesn't just say, well, I'm just going to take you on to heaven no matter what. See, now, there's a country and western song from a number of years ago that just basically said that's the kind of love a father has. It just says, come on in. Doesn't matter what you did. Doesn't matter whether you were saved. Doesn't matter whether or not you, you gave your heart to him or not. Just, just that's the kind of love a father has. Just go ahead and come on in, and everyone's going to go to heaven. Now, the fact of the matter is that's the mentality of the world. Everybody just thinks them, their dog, and their cat, and everybody else is going to heaven, you know? But the fact of the matter is, is that when someone is redeemed, washed by the blood, come under the blood of Jesus Christ, receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there is a different relationship between them and the Father. And, and so that love, if you please, is taken to a, to a, a different level, to a different uh, perspective, a different relationship. And, uh, and so the, 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 uh, the love that God has for us, 
God said that we in fact should show that same love towards someone else that's begotten of the Father. Now, I realize again, like I said, I realize that the world just says we ought to love everybody and, and in that respect we, we, ought to, we ought to love everybody in the, in the fact just as God in desiring that they, they come to Christ. But the fact of the matter is, is that whenever it comes to as Christians, when it comes to us being washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, it should take that to a different relationship in the perspective that we have towards someone else who is saved. Now, you might say, well, but Brother Dwayne, we don't really know who is and who isn't. Well, in a lot of ways you're right. We don't because we don't know somebody's heart. The fact is, is there are some people that claim to be saved and they don't live it. And there are some people who don't necessarily claim to be saved, but they live probably better lives than some people that are claim to be saved. Now, uh, from, from that standpoint, I, I understand that there could be some, some confusion in, in that as far as, well then, how do, how do I know who to love and how, how do I know uh, who not to love? Let me just give you this clarification. If someone loved God, if someone loves the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and they evidence that in their life, and they love others, their neighbor as themselves, so to speak. If they show that love, then we should have that love towards them as family, as relationship, as being beloved of God. And so what that does is that it causes us to examine someone else's life, not in the sense of judging them, not in the sense, because judging oftentimes is taken in the sense of condemnation. But if you please examining, and in fact, the Bible talks about being a fruit, a bear, you know, uh, the fruit that someone might bear, and we could look at those things. And I'm not, you know, I know people have said that for years. I'm just a fruit inspector. Well, I think a lot of time people use that phrase as a way of trying to judge people, you know, because oftentimes people take the perspective they're trying to find those that they can call out. Okay, y'all, y'all understand what I mean by calling them out, you know. By, by being able to create that separation and that, that di difference rather than trying to find those whom we can love and whom we can appreciate and whom we can share the things of Christ. And, and, and I believe this is really the, the avenue that, uh, you know, that John uh, is trying to get us to follow in is that we're not trying to find someone that we can find some fault in. We're not trying to find somebody that we can find a flaw in. The fact of the matter is, is that's all of us. There's not a one of us that doesn't have flaws and doesn't have frailties. There's not a one of us that doesn't have weaknesses in one area or another. But then, but that's why John says in verse 2, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. And again, what was His commandments? I read several of them there. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the fact of the matter is, is that if we truly have that relationship with God in our lives, it will affect and in, and, and in fact have an effect in our relationship with others. Again, let me say that again. If we have the right relationship with the Father, it will not only have an effect on the way we love others, but it will actually cause an effect the way that we actually show and express that love towards others. And that's why he said, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Uh, the, uh, you know, sometimes I think that when we fail to keep those commandments, that when we fail to follow through in, in our love for our fellow man, it is because we have faltered in our relationship with the Father. When we fail in our relationship with God, once again, in the, in the reverse sense, 
said a while ago, if we have that love and relationship for the Father, it will have an effect on the way we love our brothers. If we find a difference in the way that we love our brethren, it is because of a broken relationship with the Father. And this is what John is trying to, to remind us. And, and again, uh, you might say, well, it's, it may be a little overkill, but uh, I, I think that he is trying to hit it from various perspectives to remind us that, that the two are actually hinged together. And, and sometimes uh, uh, we, we try to claim one without the other, or we try to dismiss the one without uh, the other and and uh, you know and, and the fact is is that John is reminding us that they are in fact hinged and 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 cloven together and uh, and he said that in verse three therefore this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. How many times have you heard someone say, well? I would love someone, but it's so hard. You know, there are some people that are just harder to love than others. You ever heard someone refer to something like that? Well, John just kind of refutes that because I believe that when we have, again, that right relationship with God, we find it easier to love those who are born of God and have that relationship with God than it is the service of sin or of that broken relationship. The fact is, is that when we have that right relationship with God, it actually makes loving our brothers easier or our sister for that matter. <clears throat> You know, sometimes we we try to gauge someone by what they've done to us. Well, I love them as long as they love me. Or I love them as long as they don't wrong me. I love them as long as I get what I want. But you see, the fact of the matter is that John is reminding us that all of those values are to be tossed out and to be reminded that the service of God to love the Lord with all thy heart, soul, and mind is actually very liberating. It's, it's, it actually gives us liberty and, and freedom. And in fact, I believe the, the inverse of that is, is that uh, the service of sin or the service of the world actually brings us into bondage. Now, does not Paul teach that in various places? That actually when we sever and break that relationship with God and it is uh, evidenced in our broken relationship with others, what it actually does is it brings us into bondage. Now, how many times have we ever heard someone say that if someone cannot or does not forgive, they themselves are in bondage? Well, that's the very reason that someone is in bondage because they, in their unwillingness to forgive, have broken that relationship with the Father. They have literally broken that, that, that love and that relationship with the Lord because of unforgiveness in their heart towards their fellow man. Now, we, you know, we could teach about forgiveness. We could go down the list of forgiveness, but I, I don't want to just harbor there. I want to, uh, I want to just maybe even just go down, down from the standpoint of bitterness, sure, anger, malice. Mm -hmm. All of those constitute the same effect. That when those things between us and a, another fellow Christian harbor those things in our heart, what is it actually doing? It is actually putting us in bondage and it hinders us from having a right relationship with the Father. Now, this is the things that John is saying and reminding us because he said, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. 
So therefore, if I'm to keep his commandments, that means that in order for me to love him in the right relationship, I can't harbor unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, malice. What was it that the Lord told Peter, even in the respect to forgiveness, when he said to forgive? He said not just seven times in a day, but 70 times seven in a day. Now, you know, we've heard a lot of sermons about that, about uh, how often we should forgive or, and all like that, but I, I don't know that it's so much that we should go around counting how many times we forgive someone and once we hit 490, I'm done! <laughs> You're, you know, that what you just did, that's 491, it's not forgiven because I only have to do four. No, the idea being is that it should be a continual. It should be a continuation. It is something that, that should carry itself on out in, in our lives. And, and, uh, and so the, the fact is, is that, that by obeying, by following the commandments of the Lord, it actually gives us liberty to love our fellow man, our fellow Christian. So John in chapter 5 is just, in, a, in essence, just kind of from a different perspective, but he's carrying on this same uh, theme or this same idea uh, that uh, faith in Christ and brotherly love are in fact united because when God regenerates us in faith, he places us in a position of love and that puts us in a position to love our fellow man. Because of his love, we are able to love others. Therefore, the only true way of believing, when someone says, I believe in the Lord, I believe in Christ as my Savior, when we say that we believe that he is the only begotten Son of God, when we say that we believe that He is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, that should be evidenced not only by our love for Him, but by our love for others. And our love for the Lord. Any questions or comments about these tonight? When you uh, ask that question, I would simply go back and say this. Would that emotion prevent you from desiring them to be saved? No. Would it prevent you from giving the gospel to them? Uh, if I can't talk to them, I can't give the gospel to them, can I? Then you've just answered your own question. Okay. I'm working on that one. Because I, I believe that, that the only way we could truly love someone to give them the gospel is to actually to find some way of getting over whatever would hinder us from sharing the gospel of Christ with them. And I think that if we, if we told someone, I want you to come to Christ, I want you to receive Christ, oh, by the way, I hate your guts. <laughs> Okay. That well, I would simply say that that would that would actually be a, a you know a, a conflict of, of representation, if you please. What if I say I would like you better if you come to No, I understand. I understand. I understand. But I would just again, I would just simply go back to to say this uh, that. In that same vein, in that same sense, what if God said, well, only if you better yourself or improve your relationship that I'll die for you. You know? Then, then I don't think any of us would ever have been saved to begin with. And so, therefore, I'm just simply saying, if it prevents and hinders us from sharing the gospel of Christ with them, then I believe that would be wrong.
<laughs> and yeah, you're right. We've all got things to work on like that. Amen. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Just concerning forgiveness, you know, I was listening to uh, Paul Chapel the other day, and he, he said, you know, I said this goes right along with what you're saying, but he says to forgive is to set a prisoner free, and that prisoner is you. Is you. Exactly. So that stuck with me. Yeah, you, you shared that with me, and I, I wasn't even thinking about that at, at this point, but uh, that you're exactly right. It, uh, t you know, to have forgiveness, uh, and I'm glad you reminded and mentioned that, to, have, to give someone else forgiveness actually sets a prisoner free, and that prisoner is you. Because when we fail, or when we refuse uh, to forgive, it actually puts us in bondage. Exactly. Anyone else? Yes, sir. In, in Job, it says, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Those that had accused him and of the death, when he prayed for them, it says, the Bible says, the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Because I, and, I, and I agree because I think that uh, with the... The admonition that they had given to him, uh, I think, was like a bitter bitterness in his heart. Uh, but but yet at the same time, I know that in all that, Job sinned not. But uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, that's what really changed and turned the hand of God is the fact that he had such a burden and compassion for them that he prayed for them. You're right. Thank you, brother. Yeah, someone someone said uh, if you, I, I believe even the Bible teaches pray for them that despitefully use you. You know, love your enemies for in doing so you you heap coals of fire on their on their head. You know, so uh, that's that's easier said than done. Praying for someone who has come against us is easier <clears throat> said than done. But that's what the Bible teaches. Amen. Any other questions or comments? All right. Amen.